our tour of historic Bonnie, Scotland. In May 2024, I had the incredible opportunity to travel to Scotland and host a group tour of fellow history lovers. Together, we explored the culture-filled lowlands, the breathtaking highlands, and the mystical Isle of Skye. We marveled at the crown jewels in Edinburgh Castle, tried to run through the fairy stones at Clava Cairns, walked back in time at Culloden Battlefield, tapped our toes to live Gaelic music in Inverness, staged a fairy wedding on Sky, met adorable ginger heifers, and so much more. So pleat your kilt or throw on your Bonnie Wee Tartan shawl and join me as we explore Scotland. Stay to the end when I will announce where we'll be going in 2025. Day 1. My mom, Wendy, was once again my travel buddy. We arrived in Edinburgh bleary-eyed after an overnight flight and cabbed to our hotel in the city center. I enjoyed Eggs Benedict on black pudding, and Mom had eggs on toast with bacon, tea for me, latte for her, at the Darling Honeycomb Tea Room nearby. We took a wee wander and found a few vintage shops, and our first glimpse of the castle, looming over the city atop an extinct volcano. Behind me is the Burke and Hare Strip Club. Now, if you don't know who Burke and Hare were, they were a couple of resurrection men here in Edinburgh back in the 1800s. And resurrection men dug up dead bodies in the cemetery and sold them for dissection to the medical school. But Burke and Hare thought that was a lot of work, so instead they just murdered people. So I wonder, if you go in for a lap dance, do you ever come out again? We cabbed to the castle for an early dinner at The Witchery, named in honor of the hundreds of women who were burned at the stake by King James VI, steps away on Castle Hill. Built inside a 16th century merchant's house, the candlelit restaurant is lavishly decorated with wood panels and drapery. It felt like stepping into another time, perfect to get us in the mindset of our historic journey. We enjoyed North Sea halibut with asparagus, morels, and champagne sauce, and roast lamb with courgette moussaka, bubble and squeak, and wild mushroom jus. Delicious. After dinner, the enchantment of the Royal Mile called louder than our beds. When the Romans arrived in Scotland in the first century, they recorded Celts living on this rock, which they called Eden. In 1124, King David I granted charters to found several cities, or boroughs. Among them was Eden Borough. The Royal Mile is the main thoroughfare, which runs from the medieval castle to the Renaissance Holyrood Palace. It's been a royal procession route since the Middle Ages. When Mary, Queen of Scots, returned from France in 1561, she greeted her people by parading up the mile under a purple velvet canopy. The old town was pinned in on three sides by the Flodden defensive wall and the Nor Lock on the fourth. As the population grew, they had nowhere to build but up. Early skyscrapers reached as tall as 14 stories, but frequently collapsed or caught fire. If walking home late at night, one might hear a shout of Garde Lou, a corruption of the French, watch for the water, followed by the contents of a chamber pot being dumped out a window. If, after a night of drinking, you weren't fast enough, you were liable to get shit-faced. This din of darkness and danger naturally bred disease. Edinburgh had no less than 11 outbreaks of the Black Plague. By the 18th century, something had to be done, which we'll explore tomorrow. In this modern and clean version of the old town, we saw a man with an owl and a hawk, which mom is particularly fond of, and a kilted piper. At St. Giles Cathedral, we turned down the hill back to our hotel for an excellent night's sleep. Day 2. After a lion and leisurely breakfast, we took a cab to the Firth of Forth, where the Forth River meets the North Sea, to visit the Royal Yacht Britannia. This ship was commissioned in 1952, the first year of Queen Elizabeth II's reign. While Her Majesty inherited many lavish castles and palaces, they had been decorated by her ancestors. She and Philip got to design the Britannia themselves. 
It was their favorite home where they felt the most relaxed, going on family holidays or diplomatic missions. The elegant and cozy staterooms and cabins gave the most intimate look at the lives of the royal family I have yet experienced. I plan to do a dedicated video all about the Britannia in the future. We were incredibly fortunate to have visited during the week of the Yachty's annual reunion. They were happy to talk to us and told us some great stories about the royals. On the Top Deck Cafe, we had tea, sandwiches, and scones, jam first as the queen insisted, topped with luscious clotted cream. Then back to the hotel to get ready to meet our group. We had all been chatting on WhatsApp and Zoom for months, but I was excited to meet everyone in person. Our local guide, Steve, arrived to lead us all to the restaurant. It was a bit of a walk, but it was a fine, soft evening for a sunset stroll, and I got a chance to chat with everyone. We walked along elegant Prince's Street, the main thoroughfare of the new town when the walled-in medieval part of Edinburgh got too disgusting and disease-ridden in the 18th century, the new town was built on a grid to allow light, air, and clean living, mostly for the wealthy. We enjoyed dinner and conversation at Howie's, where I had delicious, rich venison stew and a sticky toffee pudding I dreamed about all night. Many of the travelers had just arrived that morning, so we were all pretty tired. Steve helped us navigate Edinburgh's clean and efficient tram system to get back to our hotel for another lovely night's sleep. Now let's cover a little of the Scottish lingo I learned on the trip. Bonnie means attractive or beautiful. Bra means attractive or handsome. We means small and is used very often. Ken is to know or understand something. Blather is to gossip. A bin is a mountain, a loch is a lake, a glen is a valley. And what's the fun of learning a foreign dialect if you can't pick up a few mild swear words? To haver is to talk shit, and a donut is an idiot or an asshole. A dram is a drink, usually whiskey, so you may need a wee dram after listening to a donut haver. You would propose a toast with that dram by saying slan java or cheers to your health. This is a phrase in the Gallic language, which is related to, but different than, the Gaelic spoken in Ireland. Day 3. After carb-loading at the hotel breakfast, we met in the lobby for a walking tour of Edinburgh. We started at St. Cuthbert's Kirkyard, where Steve told us the story of Burke and Hare walked past a gorgeous Ross Fountain, gifted to the city in 1872, strolled through lush Prince's Street Garden, and learned that had we been here 400 years earlier, we would have been deep in a lake of sewage known as the Nor Lock. The disgusting dinge was where Edinburgh's refuse drained for hundreds of years. According to legend, the lock was the site of dozens of witch duckings. Women accused of practicing the dark arts would have their thumbs bound to their toes and thrown into the filthy water. If they sank and drowned, then they were proclaimed innocent. Huzzah! If they floated, they would be fished out, dragged up Castle Hill, and burned at the stake. Historic evidence of witch duckings is mixed. However, when Norlock was drained in the 1760s to make way for the new town, numerous human skeletons were uncovered. The Wojtek Memorial commemorates a Polish bear who fought during World War II and lived out his life at Edinburgh Zoo. We saw stunning vistas of the castle and the old town rising out of the mist above us as we made our way past the National Galleries of Scotland, walked past the Victorian Gothic monument to Sir Walter Scott, author of Ivanhoe and Rob Roy, who popularized the Romantic Highlands. We crossed Market Street and entered the Old Town, winding our way up Cockburn Street, past shops, pubs, and stunning faux medieval architecture. The crowded, unstable structures of the Middle Ages were largely replaced in the 1800s to make the area safe and airy. Continuing up the Royal Mile, we stopped at St. Giles Cathedral, where a wedding was taking place. Steve pointed out the Heart of Midlothian, which marks the entrance of the old toll booth, where criminals were once executed. Locals took to spitting on the heart as an act of disdain for capital punishment. Now people spit on it for good luck, so watch your step. 
We walked through the grass market, then climbed up the Vinyl viewpoint to get an impressive glimpse of the castle and a group photo. I designed t-shirts as a welcome gift and picked them up at a local print shop. They feature my four favorite royal figures from Scottish history, Kenneth MacAlpin, the first king to unite Scotland, Saint Margaret, sister of the last Anglo-Saxon king of England and wife of Malcolm III, Robert the Bruce, the hero king who won the Wars of Independence against the English, and Mary Queen of Scots, who tried to claim the English throne and lost her head. We enjoyed a pub lunch to fortify us for the climb up the mini stairs to the castle. The volcanic rock's elevation made it an ideal location for a defensive castle, but also a target. Edinburgh has been besieged 26 times, more than any other castle in Great Britain. Queen Margaret was here in 1093 when she received the news that her husband, Malcolm III, and son, Prince Edward, had been killed in battle. She died of grief and was later canonized as a saint. Her son, David I, constructed this stone chapel in her honor. St. Margaret's Chapel is the oldest surviving building in Edinburgh. The castle was a crucial royal residence, arsenal, treasury, and prison, and the site of many key scenes in Scottish history, including the Wars of Scottish Independence in the 1300s and the many Jacobite Risings in the 16 and 1700s, all fought against the English. By the Renaissance, things had calmed down, and the royals wanted more luxurious accommodations, so Holyrood Palace was constructed on the other end of the Royal Mile. But the castle is still home to royal splendor. Here we saw the Crown Jewels, properly known as the Honours of Scotland. They consist of a scepter and sword of state, both presented to King James IV by popes in 1494 and 1507, respectively. The crown was ordered by James V for his wife's 1538 coronation. King Charles II was the last monarch to wear the crown. Since Scotland became part of the United Kingdom, subsequent British sovereigns have been presented with the honors as part of their coronation celebrations. Elizabeth II was presented the honors in St. Giles Cathedral in 1953. When she died at Balmoral in 2022, her coffin lay in state in St. Giles, and the crown was placed upon it in the exact spot it had been presented to her 69 years earlier. By 2023, the sword was considered too delicate to be presented to Charles III, so a new sword, named in honor of his mother, was crafted. After touring the castle, we were free for the evening. A few of us walked back to St. Giles Cathedral. Originally commissioned by David I in the 1100s, the current structure was built in the 1400s. The stunning cathedral is pivotal to Scottish religious history and is the home of the Order of the Thistle, the country's highest chivalric order. Mom and I had a delicious meal and pints at the Piper's Rest. I had haggis, neeps, and tatties, a traditional dish of mashed turnips, potatoes, and haggis, which is minced sheep organs, onion, oatmeal, and spices cooked inside a sheep's stomach. It may not sound appealing, but it is actually pretty delicious. Duchess said it reminded her of meatloaf, and even my very picky mom decided it wasn't bad. The first known recipe dates to 1430. It is an incredibly popular dish in Scotland and can be found on many menus. Fortified, we met up with a few other travelers to explore Mary King's Close. The Royal Mile was once an artery with dozens of small veins or closes running off it. These narrow alleys were crowded with shops and homes, but many were covered up when the city was rebuilt in the 1800s. Edinburgh's underground is considered to be highly haunted. Our guide led us through the labyrinth of dark tunnels and low rooms where people once lived and died. We learned chilling tales of people waiting in anguish for the plague doctor. An entire family wiped out by fashionable wallpaper dyed green with arsenic. And we got the chills in Annie's room, where visitors present dolls to the ghost of a young plague victim. It's a good thing I'd walked so much because I was too tired to have nightmares. 
Exploring Bonnie Scotland with an incredible group of fellow history lovers was such an amazing experience, and I can't wait to do it again. I'm excited to announce that my next adventure will be to Germany and Austria. Join me from May 13th to 20th, 2025 for a magnificent eight-day adventure through Munich, Salzburg, and Vienna. We'll explore fairy tale Neuschwanstein and Hohenschwangau castles, where fabulous King Ludwig II mysteriously died. See the stunning Alpine vistas that inspired Mozart and The Sound of Music. Waltz in the footsteps of Empresses Maria Theresa and Sissi at decadent Schönbrunn Palace. We'll indulge in delightful culinary experiences, especially cheese and chocolate. The trip includes welcome and farewell dinners, hotel stays, breakfasts, in-country transportation, entrance fees, and the invaluable insight of a local guide. Plus, I'll be there to share historic stories and fun facts. Bring a buddy or fly solo. We'll all become friends along the way. If this sounds like music to your ears, then click the link in the description to book your spot on this historic adventure today. Day 4 Happy Birthday Jenny! We packed up and piled onto our home on wheels for the next four days, the Haggis Adventures Tour Bus. The bright yellow bus with wild and sexy plastered on the side was easy to spot, got snickers in small towns, and perfectly fit the mood of the tour. Steve supplied the tunes, a fun mix of traditional Gaelic and Scottish pop music to get us in the Highland mood. Our first stop was Dunkeld. We walked past the picturesque village on the River Tay, where Beatrix Potter once wrote Peter Rabbit, to the medieval cathedral. Back in 1034, the McAlpin dynasty came to an end with the death of Malcolm II. He had three daughters and their husbands fought over the throne. The eldest, Bethok, was married to Crinen, the powerful lay abbot of Dunkeld. He won the throne for his son, Duncan I, who founded the Dunkeld dynasty. The cathedral is the resting place of Alexander Stuart, aka the Wolf of Badenoch, a very bad dude. As a younger son of Robert II, he had little hope of getting the throne, so he kept busy by abandoning his wife and children and burning the city of Elgin and all of its inhabitants to the ground. His life of infamy came to an end, according to legend, after he lost a game of chess with the devil. His mortified family buried him in this out-of-the-way cathedral. Welcome to the Highlands! Oh! Welcome to the wonderful, the beautiful, the majestic Highlands! We toured Blair Athol Distillery, founded in 1798. Our guide, Kat, taught us about the whiskey-making process, as the delicious, sweet and yeasty smells filled the air. We glimpsed barrels older than me, which are only uncorked to be included in very special and expensive blends. While whiskey ages, about 4% evaporates each year. This is called the angel share. Finally, we tasted a delicious dram of whiskey. In the States, we call this scotch, but in Scotland, it's all scotch, so they just call it whiskey. Or in Gaelic, ishkebaha, or water of life. We stopped in the village of Pitlochry for lunch, then drove through the breathtaking Cairngorms National Park. We explored the Highland Folk Museum, a village which recreates Highland life in the 1700s. A costumed guide showed us around the stone and thatched cottages, the largest of which houses a wooden box bed which would have been used by the whole community for childbirths, wedding nights, and deaths. It really felt like traveling back in time or into a Tolkien novel. Scenes from season one of Outlander were filmed here. Next stop, Clava Cairns, a set of three Bronze Age stone burial chambers. Their doorways orient southwest towards the midwinter sunset. In the clearing were dozens of standing stones. The Outlander fans among us, myself included, had fun running towards the stones in an attempt to travel back in time. Woo! She's gone. The ring of fairy stones in the show is fake 
but these were the real deal, placed here by ancient people over 3,000 years ago. We were making a great time, so Steve asked if we were up for one extra stop, the Culloden Battlefield. On the drive, I recounted the royal conflict which led to the Jacobite uprising. Catholic King James II and VII of England and Scotland was ousted from the throne in favor of Protestant William and Mary. He made many thwarted attempts, with the support of the Irish and Scottish, to regain the throne. Meanwhile, the English imposed many abuses upon the Scots. It all culminated in James's grandson, Bonnie Prince Charlie, arriving in Scotland in 1745 to a groundswell of support from Highlanders. The Jacobites, derived from the Latin for supporters of James, initially won a few battles. But after weeks of marching, the men were exhausted when they finally came here to Culloden Field to face the mighty British army under the command of Prince William, Duke of Cumberland. The Highlanders were heavily outnumbered, outgunned, and positioned on lower, muddy ground. But still, they bravely charged. The battle lasted 40 minutes. When it was over, 50 government troops were lost but 2,000 Jacobite soldiers lay dead. Prince William, who became known as the Butcher of Cumberland, ordered injured Highlanders to be murdered where they lay. Hundreds more who escaped the battle were run down and executed in the following weeks. The British broke up the clan system, outlawed bagpipes and tartan, and decimated Highland culture for centuries. The victims of that bloody battle were laid to rest under this field in mass graves with stones marking the names of their clans. Being here in person was incredibly moving. We ended our day in Inverness, the capital of the Highlands and a central location in Outlander. After dinner, Patricia, Rosie, Michael, and I went to the Highlander, where we were treated to Gaelic music, performed by Cullum MacPhail. Locals were up and dancing, and I felt like I was in the steerage scene from Titanic. I still can't get the song Bonnie Wee Jenny out of my head, and I'll link it below. As we walked merrily back to the hotel at 10 p.m., the sun was just setting over the River Ness. Day 5 We made a stop to see Loch Ness, the largest and deepest lake in the UK, but no monsters were spotted. Aelin Donan Castle is nestled on an island between three locks. It was the 11th century fortress of Clan Mackenzie. After Culloden, English ships blasted it to smithereens, but it was rebuilt in 1919 and has since been featured in numerous films. Bonnie Prince Charlie escaped Scotland with the help of Flora MacDonald, who disguised him as a woman. Together they took a boat over the sea to Skye. This adventure was immortalized in the Skye Boat Song, which was rewritten as the theme song to Outlander. We listened to both versions as we followed in their footsteps over the sea to the Isle of Skye. In the morning, the island was covered with mist, per its namesake, and we couldn't see the famed Old Man of Storr rock formation. But soon, the sun burned the fog away and lit up the landscape. In the warmth, the yellow grouse blossoms gave off the surprising aroma of coconut. We stopped for lunch in Portree and walked around to see the sights, then spent the afternoon leisurely circling around the north of Skye. We made frequent stops to see the jaw-dropping ocean vista and waterfall at the Kilt Rocks, walked over a sheep-strewn hill to discover a tranquil lochen, mini lake, surrounded by quiet mountains, and visited Kilmuir Cemetery to pay our respects at the grave of Flora MacDonald and fashion designer Alexander McQueen. Along the way, Steve told us the fairy legends of the Isle and of the real-life blood feud between the MacLeod and MacDonald clans. 
Finally, we stopped at Slikshen Bridge, where he told us the tale of the wedding which wrought peace between the warring clans. Michael, Taylor, and Kate volunteered to act out the parts. In the story, the McDonald bride was old and scarred, while the McLeod groom was young and bra. He reacted with horror when he lifted her veil, and she went with her servant to the riverbank to cry. Just then, the king of the fairies appeared and offered to turn the river into a fountain of youth. The servant tested it first by dipping their face in and emerging young and bonny. Next, the bride came out wet and dazzling. Finally, the cruel groom demanded a go. But instead of becoming more handsome, he caught the age and ugliness of the bride and servant, who left him and ran away together. We all had a good laugh and took turns dunking our own faces in the river. We stayed the night in the small village of Kalken and had dinner at the hotel. I enjoyed pickled herring, halibut, and sticky toffee pudding. We strolled along the water to the nearby King Hokon Inn and enjoyed a few pints as we watched the sun set over the water. On the walk home, we saw a lone sheep wandering around the village. Perhaps she had enjoyed a few pints too. Day 6 Armadale Castle was built in the 1790s by the MacDonald clan. It has since been damaged by fire and abandoned. Unfortunately, the structure was no longer safe to walk in, but the gardens around it are lovely, and the Museum of the Isles had an impressive collection of artifacts. We popped in the restaurant to get tea and whiskey tablet, a creamy fudge-like Scottish confection to share on the bus then on to the ferry, which would carry us away from the mystical Isle of Skye. During the short but stunning crossing, we saw dolphins and jellyfish. Back on the mainland, Steve surprised us that we were just in time to watch the arrival of the Jacobite Express, the inspiration for the Hogwarts Express. The Harry Potter fans, Mom and I included, were thrilled. At Glenfinnan, after a short hike up the hill, we were treated to a spectacular view of the famous bridge and the lock below. We stopped for lunch in Fort William, nestled at the base of Ben Nevis, the tallest mountain in the UK. We saw many hikers preparing to trek the mountain or the West Highland Way, a famous 96-mile trail from here down to Glasgow. After a delicious fish and chips, we headed to Glencoe and took in the beautiful surroundings, including the spot where Hagrid's house once stood. It had to be removed because it attracted too many tourists. Sadly, this placid place was the site of a famous massacre. In 1692, British soldiers, aided by Clan Campbell, murdered 30 members of Clan MacDonald. This was one of many grievances which drove Highlanders to fight for Prince Charlie at Culloden. To this day, many local establishments will not serve people named Campbell. We finished out the day in Oban. After a lovely walk along the waterfront, we enjoyed a delicious dinner. I had West Coast Bay Chowder, mussels and fish in a delicious creamy garlic and white wine broth. After dinner, I took a long walk along the beach, savoring the sunset and the clean sea air, and reflecting on my journey thus far. Hearing the stories and then seeing that we were there, it's just been, it's been magical. I've loved getting to know everyone on the tour. They've been so kind and interesting and it's just been really fun. I'm quite wistful that it's going to be over, but I'm just enjoying every moment of it. Day 7 we loaded onto the bus for our final tour day. St. Conan's Kirk was built in 1881 and incorporates an eclectic blend of styles, from ancient Roman to Norman. Our resident architects, Michael and Alman, confirmed that it breaks all the rules, but in a fun way, and the flying buttresses aren't doing anything. The Kirk is home to a stunning wood and marble effigy of Robert the Bruce, though only a fragment of the outlaw king's shin bone is interred here. We stopped at the Green Welly, a famed outfitter with excellent food and souvenirs, then at a farm to meet Hamish and Honey, two gorgeous highland cows, or hairy coos as they're called, whom Steve knows well. 
We stopped in Calendar for lunch. Apparently, it's a great place to get a date, but I got a delicious steak and haggis pie and a meringue as big as a baby's head. My mom spotted a charity shop and was never seen again. Our final tour bus stop was at the Kelpies, a pair of 100-foot metal statues based on the fairy creatures who are supposedly irresistible to ride, but once you climb upon them, you can't get off. They race to the water, drown you, and devour your soul. Despite the ominous legend, it was a lovely spot for a farewell toast. We enjoyed chocolate orange whiskey and tonics tea cakes, courtesy of Steve. We arrived back in Edinburgh at the gorgeous and historic Brunsfield Hotel. We had a few hours to spare and some went to sightsee or buy souvenirs, but I rested and watched Outlander before our farewell dinner. At Wickham's Wine Cellar, the atmosphere was even more jovial than it had been at our welcome dinner. As I had hoped, everyone had become friends along the way. My favorite part of the trip was visiting the Highland Folk Museum, seeing 18th century Highlander culture recreated, how people live really made me feel a connection to the history I've only seen in 2D pictures, seeing it in the flesh was amazing. To uh, visit to the places that we hear uh, on the History Channel and be able to see with my own eyes uh, Culloden and Edinburgh Castle and be able to uh, preserve the memory of those who lost their, their lives for one great cause. My favorite part of the tour was going to Edinburgh Castle. Mm -hmm. I love seeing the crown jewels, like the painted walls of the Taiwan, all the kings of Scotland. Mm -hmm. That was really the art of sky. Uh, I really like the nature out there and also learning about the history and the plants that live there. It's really interesting and I really liked it. Exploring the highlands, going and walking around and seeing near Inverness. Um, I like that. That was fun. Just exploring the countryside actually. Edinburgh Castle was pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Just seeing the old buildings. The prisons were pretty cool. I like that. Mm -hmm. That sounds awful. <laughs> it has like the, the fake furniture and stuff that was nice. Those yeah, places. that was actually a pretty cool part. Yeah, the cemetery, the graveyard was pretty cool. Just hanging out with everybody was also pretty cool. Loch Egg, mm -hmm. uh, up on the Isle of Skye. Also Glenfinnan, looking out over Lake Shiel. Uh, just the natural beauty of, of Scotland is, is really breathtaking. My favorite part of the trip has been the beauty of the highlands and just seeing all the green and the beautiful nature. Don't make me pick one, Liz. It's just been amazing. This is one of my dreams to come here. And I found my clan mate, Williamson. I found him. So Congratulations. I think I was destined to be here. So thank you so much, Wonderful. Lindsay. Thank you. You're very welcome. My favorite thing was meeting Lindsay. Yay! Big fan. And he was a fabulous. My favorite was the last castle that we visited on the Isle of Skye. I loved the gardens and I loved the history, of course, but the views were spectacular, the history was spectacular, as well as the company. My favorite was the best. Absolutely. It's a hard call, but if I had to say, my personal favorite is probably a beautiful city. I really want to come back. Everything's just spectacular. It's so nice. This has been such a wonderful journey, and I've enjoyed sharing it with everyone so much. If I had to pick one highlight, I would pick finally, after many, many years, getting to the Isle of Skye and hiking. And the cloud coverage and the sheep and the green it was just luscious. It was very immersive, and that's what I really loved about this entire trip. It wasn't just, we're going to get on a bus, and then you kind of just sit in your seat and watch it pass by. It was like, no, we're going to get on a bus, but you're going to get off the bus. And then when you get off the bus, you're going to walk through this, and you're going to feel like you are actually there. So I think that's probably my favorite part, was definitely the geography. Awesome. What wasn't my favorite part of the tour? So when I watch movies about Scotland, you always see like the you know, the damsel. She's like on the side of the road, and she gets picked up by the handsome man. They go off to the countryside. I love that. So that's one of the reasons why I want to come. I want to see the, the hills, the mountains. They're so larger than life. Coming here and seeing these crazy um, Lord of the Rings mountains, as I call them, and seeing the rivers and the goats. We got some amazing shots, and our tour guide was phenomenal. It was fun story. So I had an amazing time. 
My favorite part of the tour, aside from being immersed in history, was sharing it with such a lovely group of kind, intelligent, interesting, and curious people. I made friends and memories I will never forget. After dessert and fond farewells, those who had early flights headed to the hotel, and those who could sleep in or didn't care about sleep headed to Goody Do Whiskey Bar for more drinking and talking. Wild and sexy! Wild, Wild and, and sexy. sexy! After we closed them down, we went to Whistle Binkies and continued the party. We finally called it a night and arrived back at the hotel at 3 a.m., just as the sun was rising. I haven't had so much fun in ages. Day 8. After a generous lion, I devoured a full Scottish breakfast while saying final goodbyes to those heading off that morning and making plans for the day with those staying an extra night. Mom, Morgan, Uvoko, and I headed to Holyrood Palace. Unfortunately, it was closed to the public as Prince Edward, Duke of Edinburgh, and Princess Sophie were in residence though I was sad not to see the bloodstain left by David Rizzio when he was murdered in 1566 by the jealous husband of Mary Queen of Scots. It was a cool reminder that Holyrood is still a working palace and the royal family's official residence in Scotland. And the gift shop was lush. Instead, we walked down Southbridge Road and discovered a bevy of charity shops, aka thrift stores. My mom and I were in seventh heaven and found several unique antique souvenirs. After a nap, we met up with Morgan and Kate for a dinner at the Piper's Rest. I try not to repeat restaurants on holiday, but this place was so good and covered in Scottish music memorabilia. I enjoyed a smoked salmon salad, and Morgan tried the vegan haggis. Then we went on a ghost walk. Our excellent guide, Sabella, link in the description, told us stories of evil fairies, witch burnings, and the legend of the cannibal family of Sawney Bean. I will release a video all about Scotland's spooky stories and myths in October. Luckily, all the walking ensured another peaceful night's sleep. Day 9. Happy Birthday, Kyra! After one more yummy hotel breakfast with Morgan, we packed up and headed to the airport. I am sad to leave Bonnie Scotland and this incredible adventure behind. But my cup runneth over with historic inspiration, happy memories, and love. If this trip looked like fun to you, then perhaps you will join me on my next adventure in... Germany and Austria. Join me from May 13th to 20th, 2025 for a magnificent eight-day adventure through Munich, Salzburg, and Vienna. Click the link in the description to book your spot on this historic adventure today. Thank you so much to Maureen, Michael, Kathy, Vokal, Nikki, Jackie, Kate, Taylor, Patricia, Steve, Wendy, Alman, Duchess, Rosie, Crystal, Jenny, Kyra, and Natalie for sharing this amazing journey with me. You all made it much more magical, historical, and fun.